Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this Clark Wilmot webinar on managing redundancy and restructuring. As you can see from this slide, my name is Mark Long. I'm head of the employment and HR team for Clark Wilmot, and I'll be speaking to you about managing redundancies and restructuring, as I say this morning. I'll be accompanied by my colleague and fellow partner, uh, Paula Squire. The issue that we face as an economy has been very significant due to COVID-19, to, to say that by way of some understatement. In terms of Clark Wilmot as a business, we've got 700 staff spread across seven offices. And that means we are not immune to the impact of COVID-19, not at all. We feel that uh, difficulty in economic terms as much as anybody else. Across the whole country, all of our advisors have dealt with clients that are experiencing real financial distress. And perhaps unusually to say, we've also seen a number of our clients come to us in a state of some emotional distress as well, because they're seeing the businesses they've worked so hard on literally collapse around their ears. And not to underestimate the far more serious impact on health and life, nonetheless, the economic impact is very significant. And I was reading that in the UK back in March, we had 1.24 million people claiming unemployment benefit. But by May, this had gone up to 2.8 million. And that gives you an idea of the very serious economic effect this virus has caused. If you're in a situation where you need to make redundancies, that can be very challenging, a very complicated piece. So the idea of this session is to give you an overview of how redundancy works, uh, both from a larger scale perspective, so-called collective redundancies, as well as dealing with individual redundancies, the uh, individual consultation and so on. And we'll also give you a general overview of redundancy. There will be the opportunity to ask questions of myself and Paula at the end. If you have questions, use the tab on the right of your screen called, unsurprisingly, Q&A, and direct your question to all panelists. Please do not use the chat function, as I'm told, that might result in your questions being missed. So without any further ado, I'll pass you over to Paula to give you an overview of redundancy and restructuring. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. My name is Paula Squire and I'm a partner here in the employment team and I'm going to walk you through redundancy and restructuring overview. I've been advising on redundancies for the past 17 years and when I think about going through these redundancies, there are definitely a mix of two different types of employer clients that we have. The first perhaps is where they haven't gone through redundancies very often and sometimes you'll find that the employees will know more about redundancies than you do. So just be very careful to seek advice if this is the case. On the flip side, we do have employer clients who perhaps have done a million redundancies and they've done them so many times. And what you have to be careful of then is that you don't put the employee through a redundancy process, a very generic process where they don't feel it's very personalized to them. So do take the time to strike a balance in terms of the review and the process. And why does it matter and what do we have to be careful of? Well, we need to be careful with regard to unfair um, dismissal claims. So where an employee has two years service, they are able to bring a claim for unfair um, dismissal. And um, also, even without two years service, so from day one, an employee can complain about their selection. They can say that they have been unfairly selected on the basis of discrimination. So, for example, they've just come back from maternity leave or they feel that their sick record is why you're making this decision. Now, when an employer comes to me and discusses redundancy, we have to look at this in two halves. The first is the fair reason. So why are you making these redundancies? And the second half is the fair process. So even with the best redundancy reason in the world, you still need to follow through a fair process. So let's start off then by looking at the fair reason. So your redundancy, what does that mean? It can be closure of a business or workplace, which is perhaps one of the best redundancy reasons you might have. So when we look at redundancies and we look at restructure and fair reason, we look at what your business reason is for making the redundancy. So for example, closure of a workplace is a really good reason to uh, carry, out through, carry on through a redundancy. You might have, for example, that you're removing a supervisor and just having your direct junior employees reporting into your manager. You may also have, for example, that you have 100 employees doing the same job and you need to move this down to 75, all of which would be a good reason. You may also have that you're changing around your workforce and you are moving them, for example, into different roles and restructuring. We then move on and look at the process. 
So once we've got our fair reason, we've got our redundancy that we're looking at, of course, then we need to consider the other half, which is how we get there. What's the process that we then follow? Well, before we get into that, of course, I would hope that all of you have considered other cost saving measures, um, other measures that are perhaps a little less risky. So, for example, reducing your level of contractors, reducing your agency staff, maybe dealing with people on zero hours contracts. So there are lots of things that you can do short of dismissal. Um, obviously, the news never goes down very well if all of your managers are getting very large bonuses and you're cutting staff on the floor. So do consider all of those changes and what we might be able to do. And obviously, let us know if there's anything we can assist with. And I can't emphasize enough, perhaps, in terms of uh, the overall process, how, how you really need to get to grips with the plan before you get started. Many of our problems arise in terms of employees coming to us and complaining. If, for example, uh, they, the rationale or the reasons change on the way through, if you've got their job title wrong, if you haven't realized they do another half to the function of what they do. In smaller businesses, I suppose it's easier, but in large businesses, it can get lost along the way. So do check your policies. What have you promised them that you will do? Check your collective agreements. Have you promised to recognize a trade union and review it with them? And make sure when you go into that large planning phase, when you're working out what your plan will look like, uh, pull together all the documentation, Double check everything in terms of entitlements, where you are, uh, and I suppose that will bring you naturally to the point of considering, well, how many redundancies am I going to make? Uh, depending on that magical number, which Mark will go into in just a second, uh, will really depend on whether or not you have to take the long, long route and go through the collective consultation, or whether you can cut through that process and go straight to the next section, which I will cover once Mark has gone through his collective consultation special. So let me hand back over to Mark to review collective consultations. Thanks, Paula. So with any um, redundancy process, uh, there's a lot of preparatory work that you need to undertake, which most businesses will understand that and will consider all sort of cost saving measures um, as possible because no business wants to spend money recruiting staff only to have to let them go. If you're dealing with um, larger scale redundancies, often the business is in, is in some difficulty and it can be quite challenging as an advisor to turn to a business that's, that is struggling, has to make larger numbers of redundancies and say, well, by the way, there is this very, very detailed set of legal obligations that you must follow before you can remove these staff. And the business is in distress, uh, the management want to act as quickly as possible, and yet there is this collective consultation obligation which we'll look at. It is one of the most complicated areas of employment law that we have, probably second only to TUPI. And it's impossible in the eight minutes or so that I'm going to speak that to give you anything other than a framework and a flavour of what's involved in collective consultation. We have seen during the pandemic some employers ignore this obligation on the basis that the tribunals have been overloaded and so it's going to be a long time before people get to bring a claim. But if, it, if this goes wrong, you can be sued for substantial sums as we'll see. So what is collective consultation? Collective consultation is, as its name suggests, consultation at a collective level. It's, it's consultation with representatives of the staff, not with the staff themselves. The idea is that if you're dealing with large numbers of staff, <coughs> excuse me, that, <coughs> excuse me, Sorry about that, the emergency coffee came in. If you're dealing with large numbers of staff, you want to consult with their representatives because that allows the employer to cover a lot of ground. The legal obligation applies if you are dealing with 20 or more redundancies in a 90 day period from a single establishment. Now that tends to mean a single business, a single site, single warehouse, single office, that sort of thing. So when Woolworths uh, went into insolvency, eventually it was found that each Woolworths store was a single establishment. So the question, are you making 20 or more employees redundant within a 90 day period? If you are, then you're going to be subject to these rules. If you don't follow the collective consultation obligations correctly, then each employee affected can claim up to 90 days gross pay. And they don't need to bring the claim themselves. It can be brought on their behalf by one of their representatives, as we'll see. So if you imagine if you're dealing with 100 redundancies and you get this wrong, you're looking at huge protective awards. It could be enough to, 
to terminate a business. It is a very, very significant level of damages. So you need to know how to get this right. So once you've determined that you're subject to these obligations, the next question is, well, what does the actual collective consultation obligation involve? You must consult with appropriate representatives of the staff affected by this situation. Staff are affected by a collective consultation situation if they're at risk of dismissal or if they're affected by other measures associated with that dismissal, for example, shift changes and so on. So that's the group that must be consulted by representatives. So you have to determine which representatives to speak to. If you have a trade union that's recognized for the staff concerned, then you must, by law, consult with that union. But many employers don't recognize a union, even voluntarily. It might be that you have a staff body in place that's been set up, like a staff council, um, to consult on behalf of staff. These staff councils, staff bodies, can be used in certain circumstances to deal with collective redundancies. But in my experience over the last 20 plus years, they tend not to be sufficiently well constituted and well organized to be able to handle large scale redundancy exercises. Some are, but most aren't. So the best option you've got for ensuring there are appropriate representatives is to arrange an election. And it is a proper election from amongst the staff group that's affected. You must elect representatives. Now, ultimately, they're chosen by the staff themselves. But the legal obligation to ensure that the elections are fair and legal falls on the employer's shoulders. So if you have to do collective consultation and you have to elect representatives, the employer must know what the legal issues are surrounding that election. Now, we don't have time today to go through those, but be aware the sort of things you'll need to do. You need to ensure that the staff vote in secret, that the election itself is legally fair. And you need to ensure, for example, that there's appropriate number of representatives representing the staff affected. So it is quite involved. Once you've got your representatives in place, Excuse me one moment. Once you've got your representatives in place, you must provide them with written information so that they've got something to uh, talk about and understand regarding the uh, redundancy process. You have to provide written information by either delivering it to the employees into their hand, literally, physically, or by posting it to the representatives. Currently, the rules don't allow you to email it, so what you tend to see is that uh, employers email the information as well as post it. And as you can see from the slide, the, the type of information to be provided is quite detailed, and this is only a, a, an overview of what has to be given. You have to explain to the representatives the reasons for the proposed redundancies, the number and description of the employees affected, the total number of employees of that description. So you're giving detail to the representatives so they've got something to consult about. You need to explain how you're selecting the employees for redundancies, what's your method of carrying out the dismissals, what does your consultation process involve, um, how do you calculate any enhanced redundancy payments, because clearly statutory redundancy you can calculate quite easily online. And you must also provide details of the agency workers that you use. Now, why is that? You must provide details of the agency workers to the representatives, because they were equally entitled to say to you, well, don't use the agency workers and, and let's preserve uh, job numbers. So you must provide this information in writing um, before the consultation process can take place. So let's assume you've given the information correctly. There's quite a lot of detail there. The next question is, well, what does consultation actually involve and what is the timetable for consultation? We know uh, by virtue of the Trade Union Labor Relations Act, which governs all this, that consultation with representatives must begin in good time before the first dismissal takes effect. So there's no set period as such for how consultation should, how long it should last, how many meetings you should have, how long those meetings should be. But it must begin in good time. There is some sort of overlay as to the timetable, again set out in the Trade Union Labor Relations Act. If you're dealing with 20 to 99 redundancies, at one establishment in a 90-day period, then we know that consultation must begin at least 30 days before the first dismissal takes effect. Not when notice is given, when the dismissal actually takes place. If you're dealing with 100 or more redundancies, 
then consultation must begin at least 45 days before the first dismissal takes effect. It used to be 90 days uh, back in 2013, the law was changed. And what you're doing is during this consultation process, you're consulting with representatives, not just of the staff that are facing dismissal, but of all the staff affected by the dismissals and other um, aspects of those dismissals, such as having to change shifts or allocate more work because there'll be less staff to other workers. So there's a lot to talk about. When you get into the consultation meeting, the obvious question is, well, what do you talk about? The information that you've supplied, um, which the chances are the lawyers have finessed it to, to give you the safest approach to providing that information, you'll talk about that, obviously. But there are three areas that you must discuss and consult about if you're going to have lawful consultation. The first is you must consult with the representatives about ways of avoiding dismissals. Can we stop these redundancies at all? Do they have to take place? You must also discuss and consult reducing the number of employees to be dismissed. And you must also consider ways of mitigating the consequences of the dismissal. For example, are there enhanced severance payments, voluntary redundancies, outplacement support, alternative employment opportunities, things like that. You must discuss and consult on those issues. If you don't, the consultation will be unlawful and you will be sued for a protective award. We do recommend that our clients um, inform and consult about another, a, num a number of other uh, points, including selection criteria and selection method. There is a number of uh, um, topics we would recommend, which we've not necessarily listed here, but this is not something you can play at. You need proper legal advice, setting out detail as to how the information is to be given, what's in it and what to consult about, because if you get it wrong, then you can get it wrong for a lot of people. What some managers do struggle with is the concept that this consultation must be with a view to reaching agreement with the representatives. It's more like a negotiation. You don't have to reach agreement on everything, but you should at least have an open mind and be conducting consultation with a view to reaching agreement. And this is a legal requirement under the Trade Union Regulations Act. So if you are um, a manager that's dealing with a business in distress and you, you enter into collective consultation, you say, look, you know, we've got to make these redundancies because we've got to save the business. The business will go under if we don't. As tempting as it might be to say that, actually that would be unlawful consultation. You've got to go in with proposals when well, proposals are at a formative stage and say to the staff at the representatives, well, this is where we are, what is your view? And they come back to you with their responses, their proposals, and you should reply to them in writing with your view. This is the way to do fair uh, consultation. One thing that is overlooked, um, surprisingly, is the requirement of employers in a collective consultation exercise to notify the Secretary of State of the number of redundancies. Now, this must happen through something called an HR1 form, which many of you are no doubt familiar with. The HR1 form has to be received by the Secretary of State uh, 30 days before the first dismissal takes effect when dealing with redundancies between 20 to 99. And it has to be received by the Secretary of State 45 days before the first dismissal takes effect when dealing with 100 or more redundancies. You must also give a copy of this form to the representatives at the beginning of the consultation process. And if you fail to supply the HR1 form to the Secretary of State, it is a criminal offence with a potentially unlimited fine. So it's something that you must fill in. It's only a short form, a couple of pages, but it must be uh, dealt with properly and uh, emailed to, I believe it's the insolvency service actually take receipt of the form. Okay, so that is a very quick overview of collective consultation. There is a lot to it. If you're involved with larger scale exercises, you will need to take detailed advice. It's not something that can be guessed at or played at. Unfortunately, there is a lot more to redundancy, you might say, and for that part of the story, I'll hand you over to Paula. Thanks, Mark. Perfect. So as we started off, we've considered um, and planned out our redundancy. We have uh, taken other measures to reduce costs. And depending on our number, we've either gone around the, the side route of collective consultation or we've cut through to where we are now. But on either process, you will, you will end up here. So whether that's after your collective consultation or straight away, if you do have less than 20 employees that you are considering making redundant. So the first step to consider, and although I've called these step by steps, I will say that again, no one size fits all, do seek advice in terms of your own process. 
you can stop and consider if, if voluntary redundancies are something that are going to be useful to your business. Uh, you don't have to, you're not obliged to, but if you do feel that, that you're able to do that, then, then by all means do. Be very careful though in terms of your letter when you're inviting uh, voluntary redundancies. Make sure you've got some time limits and make sure you always reserve that right to turn down somebody who puts themselves forward that, for example, might be particularly expensive or has a really good skill set you'd like to keep. You might also want to consider short, short uh, service dismissals. So, for example, um, probably where we would come in and, and, and have a little bit of discussion just to check there are no red flags. But potentially, if you do have someone with less than two years service, and let's imagine you're making five people redundant and they've all got less than two years service, there is a chance to shortcut that process. Some people do. Um, it may not be in line with best practice, for example, but in terms of a legal requirement, they might could do a shortcut process and dismiss all in one day. Uh, so if that is an option, then obviously do come to us. But again, be very cautious in terms of any protected reasons. And if you are in doubt, make sure you apply a fuller process. And so when we look at our selection process, so once we've planned out and we've worked out what we're going to do in relation to these redundancies, we have to consider our fair process. Now, the first part and my first question normally is, is when you're looking at the role you're going to be making redundant, is it a unique role? Is it something that only one person holds? For example, your marketing manager, you only have one, they're higher in the hierarchy, that that's a role that potentially could be removed. Or are we talking about somebody who uh, is a part of, say, 10 other uh, individuals who carry out the same or similar role and depending on the answer will depend upon how you carry out that fair selection and what I would say is that if you do identify in your redundancy process a problem or an issue don't bury your head in the sand don't go for the ideal scenario and the ideal route make sure you do actually address it so if genuinely on the ground you have a couple of employees who do overlap who do do the same role then better sometimes to consider the pool selection than, than uh, another route so when we look at our fair selection process, as I say, with Unique, we were able to go through that quite quickly and work out the role that we might potentially be looking at making redundant. But with the pool, we would have to apply a selection criteria. Now, this would need to be fair, consistently applied. Most criteria do involve mostly objective criteria because that's a better way to be. But you can, of course, include some subjective criteria uh, in terms of making the selection and making sure that you end up with the right uh, body of employees to stay behind and, and be kept on. I would always recommend that in your criteria you have a calibration um, of two employees or two managers that are marking your staff. So one person would mark them, maybe give the employee five and six in different categories, and another uh, one of your managers would double check it and agree and sign off as well. You can weight certain criteria, so in terms of certain things that are being more important to you. And when I talk about criteria, I suppose I'm thinking of things like absence records, albeit be very careful about disability related uh, absence and other types of absence that are protected. Think about qualifications, but very much do double check the accuracy of the information you hold. Some people, of course, are taking it from CVs that they had years ago, so be really careful. In terms of the marking, ideally, you'll have more than one point between two members of staff, because, of course, if you do take on board any employees' comments as a part of your consultation process, then potentially it might flip things and another person will be at risk. So again, this is a really important stage that you can't skip. You do have to go through that properly. And again, if you want to discuss selection criteria or if you need a copy of one, then just let us know. So we've gone through our selection criteria. We've worked out we've got one individual who's using a unique position, or potentially we have a group of individuals who were pulled and pointed, and we've worked out who our lowest risk of people are. We are then going to have to go through that individual consultation process. So even if you've gone through all of the collective consultation process, you still need to speak with that individual directly. Now, as you guys will know, if you've dealt with a number of redundancies, some employees will have a lot to say and other employees won't really speak at all. So be careful that they don't force you to shortcut your own process. Don't cut it short just because that's what they want. Do go through that full process. Do work through your timings, of course. And whilst it sounds very nice that we can run through all of these meetings in a number of days and that's what you might plan out, be aware, of course, people might be sick. People might find it very stressful. Uh, they might not want to attend. They might delay it because their representative isn't, isn't available. So all of those things will need to be built into your overall time scales. Um, and I suppose at the moment with furlough, people being away from work, yes, you can consult with them whilst they're on furlough, you can have these discussions with them. Um, and obviously with maternity leave, again, you can pick up and, and discuss these issues with them. But again, be very careful with people on maternity leave. There are certain rules in relation to uh, alternative posts and, and their ability to get them above others. 
And of course, in a sick employee, you may have to delay your process whilst they feel a little bit better to get going on through. So there are there is a lot in terms of that individual consultation process. So probably um, the real meat here in terms of what we need to consider is the example process. And this is an example, no one size fits all. Some people have two meetings, some people have five meetings. Um, and again, you know, as I say, this is kind of a summary of what might be looked at. Whilst the ACAS code doesn't apply, and that's quite a good point here in terms of our redundancy selection process, you don't have to apply the ACAS code. I would still try and use the principles of it. I would still invite an employee to a meeting with a letter I would allow them generally to have someone accompany them. Um, I would go through the process and then obviously follow that up with a letter of outcome and invite to the next one. I would always make sure that as I get to the end of that process, that they really know that this meeting is the last meeting as you get to your final meeting. And so I would warn them of that in the letter because otherwise all of the redundancy meetings can blur into one and they don't, they always think that they might have another one ahead of them. And I'd make sure again, in terms of the overall review, I'd share the information with them. So I would be sharing, for example, the selection criteria for them, but not for everyone else in the team. So they might get to know what the other scores were generally, but they won't get to see someone's individual information because that doesn't belong to them. So again, going through that process, you could do as minimal as two. So starting off with the meeting and going through to the final meeting, um, but potentially you might need more in there. And ideally three would be would be recommended um, overall. So we've gone through our individual meetings, we've reviewed, we've listened to them when they've suggested things uh, to avoid a redundancy. And what I would say is all the way through your language will be potential redundancy. This is a potential situation because I've seen it before where, for example, employees might suggest to go part time, they might suggest to drop their pay. And if that's a, an ideal solution for you, the redundancy process would end. So very much you want to be using the language of potential redundancies in order that it doesn't look as if you're overall decision has already been made before you've walked through the door. You do have to have open discussions with them. And I do think you have to be very careful, much as Mark was saying at the beginning, to guide them through the process. They might not know what's going to come next. They might, you know, an employee who agrees with you as much as they can um, and agrees with your rationale. They might not necessarily agree that they should be made redundant, but taking them through and walking them through the process means they're much more less likely to take you on in a tribunal. Uh, at the end of the process. And I would also say, and probably any of you guys who are old enough to remember the previous recession, at, right now, if you make people redundant, they probably are going to struggle to find a new job. They're more likely to look back at you in terms of a potential claim because they can't find anything new. So bringing us back to the process, we have gone through some consultation meetings. And as a part of that, of course, uh, and in the midway through, you might be considering alternative uh, positions. And when I think about alternative positions, I think about perhaps you might have someone who there's another role that you would like them to go into. You're not going to make them redundant. Um, and of course, if someone wants to be made redundant and they want that redundancy pay, they might resist that alternative that you say is suitable and they say isn't. And I suppose on the other option, you might have other roles that are created uh, in your new process. And you might, for example, believe that that employee isn't suitable for that role. So again, you might not want to give them the, the alternative role. Uh, and a part of that will also need to be built into your process. So I suppose my overall advice in terms of perhaps a different role, something that's got a different skill set, be very careful. That's a, a, a common level area of dispute where an employee will say, that's my role. You've just changed the job title. I'm not happy. Um, but at the same time, if you have changed a role, if you have moved it around, if you had added the new new requirements in terms of what they need to do, uh, and obviously maybe a new pay banding, that's all quite helpful to show it is a distinct and different role. And then you can go through an interview process and you don't need to appoint them if you have a good enough reason in that respect. You don't have to give them a role just because they want it. Equally, I suppose, if you have, on the other hand, you have an alternative position that's the same or similar and that you feel is a suitable alternative, then potentially you can require them into that role. And if they don't want to take it, then, of course, there are consequences in terms of the outcome and the fact that you'll have no liability then for that redundancy payment if they refuse to go into a role that is effectively there so with a few changes. So I suppose it's, you get to the end of your process, you've had your meetings, you've had your individual meetings, you've gone through interviews or not if you have no alternative roles. I would say that there's no substitute for having all documentation in place. And the reason you want that, as I was saying, is if an employee does come to you and they do complain about the 
basis of their selection, they're not happy, then actually what we would want to do if we were assisting you and if they did raise a tribunal claim or complaint, we would want to dispose of that early or as early as we can and say, look, we went through all these processes. We had a really good reason. We had a really good process. We met the employee several times. We offered them a right of appeal. We shared all our documentation. And that's, that allows us much easier, it allows our client and the rest of the team to then say to the tribunal, actually, this claim has no reasonable prospect to succeed. And it does allow us then to dispose of them early rather than running through a full tribunal service. So all of this documentation, all of the letters on the way through are, are, you know, are invaluable to make sure that you have put in place a really robust position so that we can defend you if the employee takes it further. Now, in terms of that documentation, I would also say that it's perhaps a, a small failing we see from time to time. Some people won't take the time to include, for example, where the employee has agreed with you. At the start of the process, maybe they'll be, be a little bit more amenable. They might agree in terms of your rationale for the redundancy, even if they don't agree with the rationale for their own position. So do note where they have agreed with you on the way forward. Uh, the worst notes we see are very one-sided, where you talk at the employee, and we can't quite work out in the notes whether or not the employees agreed with you or not. So do stop and get that agreement as you go through. Obviously, with your final letter, make sure you spend some good time on that as well. What we do see, of course, if, if disgruntled employees come to us for advice, that's the letter we generally pour over to see what their position looks like. And so a good summary review of what you've done, the considerations you've had that led you to the position, being really clear about the final arrangements, last day, what happens with notice, what that restrictive covenants, all of those things will need to be wrapped into those final letters. Uh, and obviously, potentially a right of appeal um, is useful because it brings their complaints back to you rather than to anyone else. So I suppose it's probably worth here stopping and just thinking about how do we manage your overall process? How do we avoid those tribunal claims uh, on the way through? So um, as I noted before, do check your policies. You don't want your employee to know more than you do. Do make sure you keep everything um, in terms of your documentation. Make sure you note those agreements as they go through the process. Um, I appreciate obviously some of you guys have in-house in HR, but potentially if it does go a little bit wrong and you get the appeal, of course, we have an in-house um, HR consultant we lend out to clients to attend these meetings. If you don't have that skill set, just let us know. So there are options for you there where we can assist. Um, and of course, whilst I would love to have been able to go through everything in much more detail, we have a lot more to say in terms of representatives and dealing with those tricky issues, perhaps, where the representative um, tries to deal well where you are, where the employee raises lots of complaints about their scores and more things like that. But instead of going in too deep, we did want to give you an overview of the considerations you'll need to have start to finish. But potentially, if you would like to know a little bit more, train any of your managers who'll be carrying out the redundancies. We do have a couple of webinars coming up. Uh, we've extended those to a couple of hours. And I'll albeit there's a, there's a small charge on that as well. Do let us know if you'd like to attend and book your place. Uh, we are going to try and make this really practical, taking a real slow review through all of the step-by-step -step guides and obviously the, the common questions that are raised and how you might want to answer it. So do let us know uh, if you'd like to attend that. Uh, we try to leave as much time as we can to make sure that we can run through questions and answers. So uh, what I'll do now is um, ask Mark to join me back on the slides. And then what we can do is we can run through uh, your questions, see if I can see them. Mm. Thank you, Paula. Um, I can see some questions from uh, the side panel. Um, so taking those in order, um, somebody's asked, if we have a colleague, uh, if we have colleague reps appointed already, not elected by staff, can we get consent from the affected staff that they are okay to use, or do we have to elect some for the particular purpose of consulting over the structure? Um, the the difficulty with standing bodies is that um, they have to represent the affected staff. Now, if you think about it, you you may set up your representatives um, some time in advance, possibly some years in advance, and then you'll get new starters joining the organisation, people leaving, people coming, and so your affected staff group changes. The affected staff group might. Uh, have so many new starters that the existing staff body doesn't actually really represent um, their interest at all and they have nothing to do with their appointment. Even if you ask the affected staff just to agree to, to use the standing body, I would not be satisfied with that as an appropriate staff body. The rules are not particularly well written about elections and about the appropriateness, appropriateness of existing reps. 
So I think a far safer approach is to, to deal with elections. Um, you might think, well, what's the point of having a staff body if it says it deals with redundancy? Why can't we do that? Well, unfortunately, the, the law is technical, it's complicated, and it doesn't really lend itself to using existing reps. So my strong advice to you is to hold fresh elections. Our next question. Can I just check that the info to be shared with reps before collective consultation cannot be emailed? I've not heard that before, so I wanted to check. Thank you. Yeah, it's, I think it's more of a technical issue. Um, during the course of having done a number of collective consultations, as you might imagine, over the years, we've always used email because what the obligation is to deliver to the representatives in writing the information concerned. Well, as far as I'm concerned, an email is delivering it in writing. But there is a school of thought that um, it's not quite right. It's a technical breach. I doubt any judge would penalise an employer for using email. It seems ridiculous to, to think that way. And delivering in writing, as I say, I do think would cover email. But um, there is a school of thought that really you should post the material to the representatives and email as a backup. So. Um, is there a minimum amount of time before the first dismissal takes effect if less than 20 redundancies? No, no, there isn't. You can um, dismiss as you see fit. What you have to remember is the 90-day period. That runs from the date of the last dismissal. And what people might not appreciate about collective consultation is that it's not redundancy in the normal sense, like you've, you don't need the workers anymore. If I've got, say, 100 people working for an organization and I say we're going to move 50 of you across to a new job um, but if you don't take this new job you're going to lose your job then even though they've not left the organization that movement of staff from old roles to new actually triggers collective consultation so just because people aren't leaving it doesn't mean you've um, failed to trigger collective consultation be very very aware of that because we've seen quite a bit of that during the pandemic people saying well they can't do this job, but we can get them to do this. So we'll just, if they don't take the new roles, we'll just sack them. Well, no, that's actually a collective consultation situation. But uh, just to rem remind us of the question, if there was less than 20 redundancies, there's no minimum amount of time before the first dismissal takes effect. Perhaps if I can jump in there, Mark, I would also sure. say that if you did have, say, five employees who are making redundant, then ideally your consultation process would last just over a week would be beneficial um, if they did have an excess of two, two years service, but you're right, you then can go through. So there is no minimum, you can potentially do it in a day um, if they had less than two years service. So I think in terms of the overall time scale, no, you don't have to go through extra long processes, but ideally I would like to see a few meetings uh, which span just over a week. Yeah, so I was talking about the, um, <laughs> the, the, the legal limits on the 30, uh, the 30 day limit and the 45 mm. day limit it doesn't apply for people with under 20s. But you're quite right, of course, that uh, you need to conduct proper individual consultation, notwithstanding you might have less than 20 redundancies. So um, I will hand over to you, Paul, and save my throat going in a minute. Um, <laughs> given COVID 19 restrictions, how do we manage the consultation if email is not allowed? So someone is shielding, cannot meet face to face, can consultation, consultation be carried out on the phone? Um, Unsurprisingly, the law doesn't particularly deal with what happens when you can't meet face to face. The, all consultations have been on the basis that, uh, and all the cases on, on consultation are based on you meeting. But in the real world, I mean, no judges are going to penalise you because you have to do it over the phone. There is a slight difficulty because in redundancy, we do tend to offer representatives, um, even though actually it's not a legal requirement to have a representative at a redundancy meeting, mm -hmm. but you'll have to work out some sort of virtual way of you know, dialing people into the call that at least give them the opportunity to have a representative to assist them. Next question, can you go through an interview process for a pool if it's the same or similar roles or does it have to be a skills matrix only? Paula, do you want to ask that one? Yeah, so I suppose you're right. Some people will choose to do a skills matrix. Others will, and I suppose it's probably something quite popular in the local authorities, will make everyone inter competitively interview for their own positions. Um, you can do either. I suppose my preference is perhaps more for the skills matrix, um, you know, but, but potentially you could have everyone you know, interview for the jobs, you know, their own job effectively. What's your view, Mark? It's never my preference, that one. Sorry, I didn't hear you. I was stopping. <laughs> I do apologise. So I was just talking um, about whether or not you would make someone interview for their own position or whether or not you would use a skills matrix. Well, there's a, you can interview um, for alternative roles, but interviewing for their own position 
is, in my view, a no-no. There's been a case on this recently where... But it's a very local authority thing to do, isn't it, to make everyone competitively interested yeah. for, that, for, the, for the remaining positions. My preference, I think, would be for the, the less contentious model of, of, of pointing what you already have. Yeah, I mean, if you're trying to determine who should be uh, made redundant, it should be a skills matrix. You shouldn't get the person to interview for the same role um, as a substitute for the skills matrix. I would have a real issue with that. And there was a case recently, I forget if it was EAT or not, that said that that could be unlawful, so don't do that. Um, we picked up the question about making five people redundant. Paula, I think you, you've answered that previously. Mm. Um, Jacqueline Cooper, with most people being on furlough leave, I will need to appoint a rep from this group, of course. How do we deal with data protection, i.e. the rep would have to contact all those affected, so would need their personal, data, data, personal details, email, home address? It's a very good question, actually. And I'm not quite sure what the answer is, because ultimately the employer retains responsibility for uh, GDPR compliance. And if you're sending data outside of the um, computer system to, say, the home address of the rep on furlough, then it will be on their home PC uh, and so on. It won't be secure. I mean, if it happened at Clark Wilmot, we would say that the information had to be kept within our secure IT system, called a Citrix system. But I'm not sure what the answer is to that, quite frankly. Um, there is a risk. Paula, any thoughts? Yeah, what I've seen, obviously, because I do a lot of our data protection work, what I've seen is perhaps the employer becomes the facilitator. So they will, you know, offer to send letters to everybody in terms of, of managing that process. And then obviously with an invitation to then make direct contact with the rep. So they, you can facilitate it. You're right, you know, especially with people on furlough where they might not be using their primary work email and you have obtained for them their personal email. You wouldn't want to be sharing that necessarily, but you can facilitate. Um, yeah, it's Definitely a, definitely a tricky issue. Mm, no, that's a good answer, actually. Um, if we have less than 20 staff, say 15, can we carry out the redundancy process individually, uh, but in parts, i.e. three staff this week, five next month, seventh month after? Yeah, you can, if you're dealing with less than 20, you can, you can stagger those. There's no, there's no issue with that. Um, Paula, do you want to do the recruitment company one? Okay, recruitment company. With, yeah, um, so a question from Mark. Uh, recruitment company with five branches. Can I treat a consultant at one branch on their merits, or do I need to pull my consultants across five branches? I, I suppose in terms of um, the way you're looking at, I suppose you're trying to work out whether or not um, they should be considered in their one branch on their own, or whether they should be considered across everyone. And I suppose the answer to that depends, perhaps, in terms of that role and what they do. Um, do they overlap with the people in the other branches? Do they they have a zone or a sector that they work on? Um, how different is it in terms of whether or not um, they should be pulled with the other people? I have seen, I suppose, where people have dealt with it regionally. Um, so, for example, the person in the southwest uh, is therefore at risk because that's the role we're getting rid of because we don't have as much work in the southwest, but we're not going to overlap them with Birmingham. But, for example, if the southwest person in Birmingham do overlap all the time, they share and they cover on holidays, uh, then you know it depends on whether or not geography is really important to that role. Right. Um, but potentially, yeah. I would say I perhaps I would lean more towards it being a site by site basis as opposed to a, kind of a pool. Would you agree, Mark? Yeah, no, I would agree with that. Site by site works best if there's a reasonable yeah. amount of distance between the sites. If they're all clustered in the space of you know, 10 square miles, then you might have a problem. And with pooling, what the judges do, they look to see if it's logical and reasonable what you've done. So if there's an obvious um, flaw in what you've done, they'll unpick it. But if, if it's basically reasonable, they won't. So yeah, I think site and geography is, is the way to, to structure your pool. Mm. Um, if someone's not well enough to attend a consultation meeting, signed off sick, do you have to wait for them to return to continue the process? Oh, um, what, um, yeah, it's, it's a difficult one, but it depends what's wrong with them, mm. really. Um, if somebody's off with general ill health, you don't necessarily have to wait because just because you're unfit to work, it doesn't mean you're unfit to engage in the consultation process, but it depends what's wrong with them. If somebody's suffering from severe stress and depression, trying to get them to engage in a redundancy process in the first part will be difficult and to try and hold meaningful consultation where people say, well, I can't cope, I'm too stressed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, um, that would be difficult too. So it does depend on what's wrong with the individual and how they're going to engage with you. But I have done redundancies in the past with people that are off sick. When a business is closing, for example, there's not much choice. So you don't have to wait, but it depends what's wrong with them. 
and do obviously remember your obligation for reasonable adjustments throughout your process. So, you know, you will try your best. You might allow them to have, for example, a family member attend the meetings with them just to get them to go forward. So there are lots of little hints and tricks you can try to get them to engage in that process as much as you can. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely one that can hold you up slightly, but but not necessarily if you if you've got a good uh, plan in place. Mm, that's a very good point on the reasonable adjustments. Absolutely. Um, could you use a creative selection process if interviews are not desirable? Uh, for example, could you ask them to collate a portfolio of work-based evidence? On a redundancy process, absolutely not. Um, it's really important this. If, you're, if you've got a pool of people and you're making redundancies, then you must use appropriate selection criteria. If you're trying to determine who should get other jobs, not the remaining jobs, but new jobs, then you can do whatever you want, interviews, portfolios of work, reviewing all that and so on. But you can't do a creative selection process as you describe. It has to be nailed down, objective, and you can assess what somebody's done. And there is a temptation to come up, particularly I've seen in the public sector, with kind of bizarre um, selection procedures, which mm -hmm. judges are not interested in. They want you to follow the straightforward as you can selection process and work out who you want to retain and, and then make a decision. So I think you'd be taking some risk if you did a creative process, if, uh, if, it, if interviews are not desirable. Paula, anything to add to that one? Yeah, and I think just in terms of if you are looking less at the selection and more at the alternative positions, um, I have seen it before where if people don't feel like they've been given a fair shot for the other position, you know, what for the sake of an interview, you know, an hour's meeting with their manager, at least it shows that you've listened to them, you've heard their views in terms of that alternative position, and they've been given a fair shot. I do think sometimes where they don't even have a, an interview and they, you, it, it's a very short process, can sometimes feel them leaving like they haven't had that fair shot. Mm. Um question about furlough scheme, which I, I will pick up. Um, whilst understanding the yeah. furlough scheme and the reason why it was put in place, can we use the scheme to fund the notice period? Well, this has become very relevant because more and more redundancies are taking place. Can you give notice to somebody and can they serve it whilst on furlough? Thinking is as follows. Yes, you can. The problem is the latest Treasury direction, I think it's the third version, which gives HMRC the legal framework to operate the furlough scheme, has cast some doubt, without mentioning notice specifically, has cast some doubt as to whether or not it would be a misuse of the scheme to, to give notice and uh, that be served while somebody's on furlough. The Telegraph, I think, ran a piece at the weekend suggesting that it might be a, a, an unlawful practice. What we can tell you as, as lawyers that look at all this stuff and try and work out the truth within it is that we think that notice um, can be served whilst on furlough. Slightly problematically is that we're not quite sure if you have to pay notice at 100% of salary for that notice clause to be effective. Not to be too technical, but this thinking comes from the fact that holiday pay has to be paid at 100%, notwithstanding that the person's agreed to a pay cut. Well, if the government and HMRC is thinking that way, then they, they may think the same way about notice. We just don't know because there's not sufficient guidance. So yes, uh, as a principle, you can still give, we think, uh, notice and it be served on furlough. Um, can you go 19 in the pool and then after 91 days, another 19? If so, is there not a legislative trigger? Now, as long as you are outside the 90 day window, you can stagger dismissals like that. But the, the trouble is it's not necessarily very practical because a business wants to get on and, uh, and make its restructure. But yeah, you, as long as you're outside the 90 days, you'll, you'll be okay. Um, Paula, do you want to talk about bumping? I do indeed. So thank you, Liz. Um, I've heard about the concept of bumping previously, um, and this is something we can uh, instill for our pregnant staff. So I quite like that. I'm sure that there's no pun intended. Um, so in terms of bumping, that's where, for example, I might have a supervisor who I'm going to be making redundant, but instead I'm going to make the supervisor position redundant, but I'm going to allow him to bump into the junior person's role, and I'm going to get rid of the junior person instead. So that, that's the concept of bumping. Um, so whilst I make my supervisor redundant, he's allowed to then bump somebody else out of that role. He steps into it, and that person gets redundant. That one's always a tricky one. You are supposed to stop and think about if bumping is appropriate. So we, we give it in mind when we are thinking about redundancy. But I think the difficulty comes in that the junior person then is very unhappy because it's not his role at all, and he's the one who's been bumped out of it. So 
Um, to answer your question, yes, you would need to consider it for pregnant staff, as you would with any member of staff. I don't think there's anything particularly special about the pregnant member of staff. You would still need to consider it. But again, um, it's 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 probably where people come a little bit dissatisfied that you can and you could use it. Okay. Um, what are our views on out of placement support? It's more of a, a, a opinion question. Um, I don't really know if it has a tremendous amount of value. Um, I've never been involved with it. I think there's a, there's a small tax benefit for doing it, but Paula, any thoughts? Yeah, it's something that I suppose it, it feels like you're offering a nice benefit to an employee to, you know, to see them on their way to find something new. Um, some employers do it quite standardly. You're right, they've got a deal in place with a certain supplier. Um, other ones don't. And I suppose it really comes down to, I suppose, your financial package and whether you want to give them statutory minimum or whether you are being more generous in different places. The more generous you are, I would normally want to see, for example, something back in return. So if you were enhancing your redundancy scheme, you were giving them extra money, you were um, given them outplacement, you might want to consider a settlement agreement at that point to make sure that they waive their rights in return for you being more generous. Mm, yeah, fair enough. Are we able to share these slides after the webinar? I think we're going to share a recording uh, of the whole thing, in fact. Um, there has been a response to, an, to another lawyer confirming that notice can be served on furlough and paid for through the furlough scheme to furlough limits. Yeah, that is the received legal wisdom at the moment. It's just difficult when um, the government, and it's been the case throughout the furlough scheme, um, are not particularly clear. Because I get the impression the Treasury don't like the HMRC. And <laughs> um, do, do you get that as well? Because if you look at the guidance that um, HMRC issue, they do disagree with the Treasury. And you must understand also that some of this furlough guidance um, I think the the main document about check if your employer can claim has been amended something like 25 mm. times. Uh, it's, it's awful. But um, yeah, we still think it's the case that you can serve your notice while on furlough. Can and the flex, yeah, oh, sorry. So I was just going to add in that, that for some of our clients who are really struggling financially, uh, they, they're going for the full package. So they are making people redundant, putting them on notice through their furlough and also requiring them to use their holiday during that period as well. So that, that you can go for the full whammy if you wanted to. Um, picking up on the question, can selection criteria be based on behaviour as well as technical ability? Yes. Um, the criteria that I use, I've been um, using them probably for about 15 years, um, which they probably refer to post rather than email because it's so old. But the, the truth is that they work. So what we tend to do is choose criteria that's based on uh, ability, skills, flexibility, adaptability. Now, those are all very subjective concepts. So how do we introduce the relevant element of objectivity to the test for the criteria, which is the legal requirement? What you do, you go through a process called calibration, which um, Paula mentioned, whereby several people score the individual. And that way introduces an objective assessment of subjective criteria, and that's perfectly lawful. So if you do it properly, you can use selection criteria based on behaviors, both past behavior, um, so like with disciplinary of course, and future behaviors, like how will people respond to the, to the, um, to the changes. So you, you keep the best people. The days of um, length of service being used as a criterion, um, those are long behind us, they really are. Um, and a comment from Joe McKinnon. Thanks to all. Very useful. I've had to leave, but it was really useful. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate the support. Okay. Well, I don't think there are any other questions, are there? No, and I think that probably wraps us up quite nicely in terms of timing to allow you all to get off. Cool. Um, um, if you do have any other questions, any other thoughts, please just uh, email myself or Paula. Um, so we're happy to answer anything. And as Paula mentioned, Paula, if you want to move on to the next slide, I think. It's impossible to give you the detail you need in a redundancy exercise um, today. It's simply not possible. That's not our intention of this free webinar, is to give you an, an overview of what's involved and to highlight certain risks. If you do want to have more information, then we do do a, a, a paid for session with it. It is more detailed and more interactive, and uh, I think people can get a lot from that. Um, but first of all, thank you to the 150 odd of you that did log on this morning. That's much appreciated. Sorry for my cough. Um, but there you go. And uh, I'm glad that it's all worked pretty well. So thanks very much. And that's the end of the webinar. Bye-bye. Thank you.